Canto 4 of The Paradise is, I think, about the relationship between the tensions that we feel in life and the possibility of transcendence, the possibility of seeing more. And its message, you might say, to cut to the chase, is don't go for the easy option. Bear the difficulty, bear the struggle, wait for the new insights, wait for the new perceptions that don't just resolve the immediate tension so much as transcend it altogether, because that is to be on the journey of ascent. And Dante sets the canto up by saying that he found himself caught between two questions that had been bearing on him through Canto 3. You remember Canto 3 ends with him being dazzled by Beatrice. It's one of these moments which we're beginning to become familiar with where he gets kind of almost over overwhelmed by what he is in being invited to see next because he just sort of feels incapable. Um, it's part of this dynamic of tension and transcendence. Um, and he says that he was like um, someone who was starving, caught between two delicious foods and who risked actually starving because they couldn't, didn't know which one to choose. Um, or he says that he was like um, a lamb caught between two wolves um, and being terrified by both wolves, didn't know where to run and so got caught by them. Or thirdly, he was like um, a dog who was stood between two does and didn't know which one to chase because it couldn't decide. Um, it's an interesting stacking up of examples because, you know, sometimes the figure in the middle um, is the one who's the victim and sometimes the figure in the middle is the one who is going to go for the chase and go for the kill. Um, and it doubles up um, the tension, you know, it, it increases the sense of overwhelm. And I think, interestingly, parallels similar moments that we encountered in the Inferno and in the Purgatory. Because if you remember, there was the early stage in the Inferno where Dante comes across the figures who are just running after the flag mindlessly. They can't decide what to follow themselves and just so follow the nearest nearby leader. And that leaves them in this state, not even of limbo, actually. And they couldn't decide anything at all. And so they hang right on the edges of life itself. Um, then in the purgatory, before we got into purgatory proper through the gate of purgatory in the anti-purgatory, we encountered those souls who were sort of wandering around listlessly. Um, they knew perhaps that they'd entered the afterlife but didn't know quite what to do next and it took them time to become orientated. And so we've got the equivalent here in Paradise where Dante finds himself increasingly surrounded by amazements and wonders, um, possible satisfactions of his desire, and yet he's sort of sport for choice. He can't decide which question, which perception, which insights to go for next. And so he too finds himself in this state which is again appropriate for being in the sphere of the moon, this sublunary condition. Um, it's part of this state of mind, part of this sphere of reality. Um, now, being surrounded by so many wonders, you don't know quite which to turn to next. That is a real spiritual state as well. And in its own way, even while surrounded by delights, can keep us trapped, can keep us in lesser states of reality, when there's the possibility of transcendence. If only we can tolerate um, being overwhelmed by the dazzlement um, and also, as Dante will learn from Beatrice, becoming aware of when hints and nudges, when grace actually approaches us to show us the way forward. And indeed, Beatrice comes to his aid. She sees the state of confusion he's in. Um, interestingly, Dante says that she comes to his aid much as Daniel had come to Nebuchadnezzar's aid. You know, the story when Nebuchadnezzar had these dreams that he couldn't understand and in mounting frustration, in mounting wrath, was having various dream interpreters put to the death. And that's how horrible the tension was for Nebuchadnezzar. 
until Daniel spoke and relieved the tension. So the implication now is that Beatrice is going to speak and relieve the tension. Um, you know, this, this element of violence um, in Daniel's, in, in Dante's parallel with Daniel, um, suggests that perhaps he's even, you know, scared to ask the question. He's scared of what the answer might reveal. Um, you know, that can be another factor in this uh, when we get too nervous to know the truth and so sort of hold off from hearing the truth. And there's another element that I think is implied by their interaction, because Beatrice says that she's going to speak for Dante. Um, and that's a contrast, because before, even though she'd known what he was wrestling with, she'd encouraged him to speak for himself. And I think that whether we have words spoken for us or whether we speak for ourselves um, is another element of this dynamic of assent. You know, sometimes we can find the words and so speak for ourselves, and um, sometimes we can't and so need to be given something. Um, but the play between those two states is what leads to the spiral up. Um, anyway, in this case, Beatrice is going to speak for Dante and so um, foster his continued assent. And she says that she can see that he's caught between two questions um, which lead to this terrible conundrum. Um, one is that he's confused because Picarda and Constance had both not willed what happened to them. They both wanted to stay in the cloister under their vows, but had been forced to take these secular positions. And so Dante feels it's kind of unfair because their will was constant, even if they were actually forced to move by wills that they couldn't control. And then his second question that Beatrice sees is, look, they've ended up in the sphere of the moon. And isn't that an operation of fate? Um, he's thinking of how we are influenced by material factors in our life. Um, we've encountered this before. Um, in the medieval period, people were more inclined to think of how the stars influence us and maybe even determine our lives. We're now more inclined to think about how maybe genes influence us and determine our lives. Um, but if that's so, um, Dante is wondering, you know, what's freedom got to do with this? What's divine blessing even got to do with this? Doesn't this make our ultimate fate? Doesn't this make our place in paradise arbitrary? And doesn't that even make God a kind of tyrant? Um, a kind of mechanistic monster who just allows things to unfold without any freedom of choice, without any grace, without any real freedom. So you can see why these are really very pressing questions, um, because again, at least in principle, they threaten to undermine everything that he thought was being revealed to him. I half wonder whether you can even imagine Dante might be feeling Am I about to drop right out of paradise, maybe back to purgatory or even the inferno? Is the whole thing about to come apart? But Beatrice gives him an answer. And it's an answer that doesn't directly address the immediate question, but instead opens up a new perspective which transcends the questions altogether. And this is a key dynamic in the ascent. Um, it's this idea of a third position. Um, that when we feel we're caught up, entangled with um, a conundrum, a problem, a perception, a struggle, a trauma even, um, that we just can't resolve. The spiritual way actually is for a new take on life to be opened up altogether. I mean, it's partly what happened to Picarda when she said that now she's in paradise, she can see her life in the round, she can take in her suffering, um, and so can share God's bliss. And what Beatrice does is actually explain um, what I think Picarda had been intimating already, which is that all souls, in fact, share in the fullness of God's bliss in the Imperium. Um, you know, Beatrice says whether they're the Virgin Mary um, or whether they're the least of, apparently the least of the souls in heaven, they all share fully in God's bliss. But they're differently capable of reflecting that bliss. 
you know, we're individuals, we stay conscious, we stay ourselves in some way, even as we're transhumanized, ascending into the heavens, our individuality remains. And that partly shows up by the extent to which we're able to reflect God's glory. Um, and hence, you know, some people are in this state of mind associated with the moon and that dimension of reality. Um, and so can be seen there as well as in the Imperium. Now, Beatrice qualifies this answer um, by saying, look, in a way, this is an answer which is appropriate for your state of mind, Dante, um, in the sphere of the moon. And because it's one, when you think about it, that rests on a metaphor drawn from sensory perception, the idea of reflection, um, the souls that can reflect certain aspects of divine glory. And she says, look, there's going to be another way of understanding this, which will be revealed further up. Um, but accept this for now. And at the very least, learn that these kind of transcendent answers um, move you on. Um, they're not like literal answers. You know, she says that it's a bit like someone saying, but the Bible says God has hands and feet. So where are God's hands and feet? I demand to see God's hands and feet and I refuse to move on unless I do. Um, you know, that is not the kind of place you want to be in, that kind of literalism, that kind of fundamentalism. It prevents you from ascending through paradise. I mean, who knows, maybe even prevents you from entering paradise, keeps you trapped in some terrace on Mount Purgatory, um, the, the horrible um, dangers and errors um, of fundamentalism. But it enables Dante to see a little bit more now, um, to take a next step. Um, and that's the important thing. She then turns to Plato's dialogue, the Timaeus, to address Dante's question about the influence of the stars and whether they cause people to be fated. Um, it's very fascinating um, to me, who loves Plato, to hear Beatrice talking about the Timaeus. Um, and I think that the way she talks about it shows that Dante really understood the Timaeus quite fully. Um, the one thing which everyone knows about the Timaeus um, apart from perhaps that the myth of Atlantis is in it, um, is, that Dan is that Plato describes it as a likely story. Um, it is, you might say, a sublunary account, in Timaeus's case, of the creation of the cosmos. Um, it's Plato's most materialistic dialogue. And I think what Plato's doing in that is exploring the fullest possible understanding of the creation of the cosmos from a materialistic point of view and saying look a lot of beauty um, a lot of insights can be gained from the story which materialism gives um, which is something that you know we understand very profoundly now because modern science with its materialist take on the cosmos does open up extraordinary things about the state of reality but Plato in the voice of Socrates had the wisdom to realize it's just a likely story. It's a kind of provisional one based on the perceptions that those telling the story can enjoy. And so Beatrice here answers Dante by saying, look, this thing about influence and fate, um, it seems that way. And because its perception of reality is limited um, in Dante's case, it's limited by um, this um, rather mechanistic understanding of astrology, um, you know, as if your, I don't know, your birth chart somehow determines everything that's going to unfold in your life. Um, there is a certain um, beauty to that, because maybe um, Beatrice says it shows how, you know, we're not individuals just going through an inanimate inert kind of cosmos, but were living souls, living amongst divine intelligences, divine principles, cosmic souls. And so there's bound to be some interaction there. But it's not deterministic, it's not fated, because as perhaps you're beginning to see Dante now, she says, um, there's something much more dynamic going on. Um, and that's part of what is to inhabit the moon sphere, inhabit this sphere of reality. Um, to explore all its possibilities. You want to see and understand all the possibilities of this take on things, you know, much as in the darker, more um, 
frightening sense Dante had explored all of reality in the Inferno, um, but also now learned that it's not the full story. Um, you know, unlike the souls trapped in Inferno who couldn't see any more than just what was immediately around him, Dante is being encouraged to develop his transcendent sight as well as ask his immediate questions and relate those things together because that produces the energy and the dynamic of ascent. So I think Plato understood that entirely as well. It's why he, write, why he writes these different dialogues that fully and richly explore the questions pressing in on Socrates and his interlocutors, but they're done as dialogues. They're not done as definitive answers. They're done precisely so that by exploring things, we can reach a limit of our understanding. And that limit is the springboard to understanding more and more and more, because in actual reality, there is always more to see and understand. Beatrice adds that that's why there are these heavens of Jupiter and Mercury and Mars. Um, that is precisely the path to transcendence, to understand all these different aspects of reality. But then she adds something else. She says that, look, if you look at Picard and Constance again, there's something maybe a bit harder to learn, um, but nonetheless um, is another truth, another aspect of this story, um, that whilst they were forced and whilst their wills internally wanted to remain in the cloister under their vows, um, they did abet the external force insofar as they didn't actually refuse it to the point of death, Beatrice says. Um, and she points to martyrs like Lawrence, who did resist um, what others would force them to do to the point of death, and so died as martyrs. And I think Beatrice just points this out here and now to say that it does show something of their divided will. And that, sure, internally they wanted to stay where they were and to pursue their religious life. Um, but they did, at the end of the day, comply with um, the um, insistence that they re-enter secular life. And, you know, that division is going to show up now. Um, in this place of paradise where all truth is seen clearly. Um, it can't be otherwise now in God's light. Um, and so that's part of what Dante is seeing in the sphere of the moon too, when he encounters the souls there. But this only leads Dante to another tension. Um, I think because he can see now that Picarda and Constance would have caught, been caught between two options, a bit like he himself has been feeling in this canto, you know, a bit like the starving man caught between beautiful food, or perhaps more in the lady's case, um, like um, the lamb caught between two wolves. Um, and he can't speak it. Um, you know, maybe he's too terrified to question Beatrice. Uh, maybe um, the tension is just too much. And so Beatrice again speaks for him and says, look, I can see that you feel that there's something profoundly unfair about this because they were caught between two evils. Um, and she says it's a bit like Alcmaeon, um, who was a mythological figure actually discussed by Aristotle, um, who had to avenge his father by killing his mother because his mother had actually led to his father's death. Um, and so, you know, he lived a kind of impossible life at the end. Um, having to kill his father um, to avenge his mother. Um, you know, what a, a horrible conundrum to face. Um, these things do happen in life. But again, it gives an opportunity for Beatrice to offer a third position, um, a transcendent take on these things, another kind of little nudge, another little step up. And what she says to Dante now is that, look, you're right to ask these questions. Um, but what it maybe starts to show you is that we human beings, if you like, have a kind of divine twin. Now, she doesn't put that like that. Um, this is a notion from spiritual traditions, which um, I find quite helpful. Um, but I think it comes to the same thing, because what Beatrice does actually say is that we have what you might call an absolute will. And that's the divine part of ourselves, which is constant, is fixed always, if we attend to it, knows what's good, beautiful and true. Um, it's our kind of spiritual compass. Um, but we also have our conditioned will, 
um, which you know more often than not, but not is the one that we go with in actual life, in mortal life, um, which you know makes us have to choose between paradoxes, um, leaves us in these kind of terrible states. Um, and in life, Picard and Constance followed this conditioned will, um, which is why they did what they did at the end of the day. And this is not just a kind of rational solution to the problem, um, but I think does intimate real insight into the nature of reality, because in some way it drives right at the heart of the human vocation, which is to bridge the mortal and the immortal, the human and the divine, um, to become incarnate in life. Um, you know, it's what the great saints of the Christian tradition and other traditions do. Um, the type in Christianity, of course, is Jesus himself. Um, and so it shows um, both what happened to Picard and Constance in life, um, but also reveals something of, you know, the great calling that we human beings have, um, that if we were to see, if we were to perceive a right, um, we would sacrifice everything in order to fulfil it, because it would lead to the greatest things of which we're capable, the satisfaction of all our desires and sharing in divine glory. So Beatrice has kind of raised the stakes once again, and maybe unsurprisingly, um, this throws Dante into yet another state of feeling overwhelmed. Uh, first, he thanks Beatrice. He says he can feel the truth of what she's shown him flowing into his life. It is carrying him further into this aspect of reality, this moony state. And he's deeply grateful for that. Um, but he's also becoming dazzled by her once again, um, this experience he has when he wants to see more and stares into her eyes and finds that he just can't in this moment. The canto that began with this relationship between tension, unbearable tension, and the desire to transcend gets thrown up, put centre stage again right at the end, as we would expect, because Dante is indeed in the sphere of the moon. He's in this liminal zone and we'll have to wait for the next canto to find out what he is led to understand, which when he's caught up in the terrible paradoxes, he can't begin to feel there's a way out of.